I want to project the right image of what a Jew is all about. In a most complicated world, the underworld. For that reason that I took that attitude, that's the reason I'm sitting here, I'm alive. My name is Myron Sugarman, all right? I am known as the last Jewish gangster. I wrote a book, my biography, autobiography, it's called The Chronicles of the Last Jewish Gangster. So I'm born 1938, <clears throat> Newark, New Jersey. Growing up as a kid, my father, Allah Shalom, was connected with the Jewish underworld. All that world was um, tough guys, very proud Jews not particularly religious. For them, Judaism, being a Jew, was a question of Jewish pride. They were born Jews, their parents were religious people, but they didn't grow up in the religious area. My father, along with his friends, grew up in a period of a time which was called the Roaring Twenties. So they were a combination of Roaring Twenties and proud Jews, and then of course, when the 1930s, in Newark, New Jersey, there was a growing anti-Semitism, Jew hatred that was uh, very prevalent in the United States. Growing up, the stories, my bedtime stories that my father told me were stories of Jewish heroics, of the Jewish gangsters and prize fighters and tough guys that uh, beat up the members of what was known as the American Nazi Party or the brown shirts. I would say that uh, I wasn't really exposed to it other than the stories that I was told. The war ended in 1945, and I, I remember going to Hebrew school, which I started as a kid, five years of age. After school, after public school, we'd go to Hebrew school, but we didn't really get what was a real complete Jewish education. The object was to teach us to read in Hebrew not to understand it, but the object is to get you educated enough for your bar mitzvah and for the party of the bar mitzvah. As a kid, nine years of age, starting at the age of nine, I didn't, we didn't go to, to shul on Shabbos. We didn't have, in the suburb, when we moved to, to Maplewood, there was no temple. There was no synagogue. You got prepared for your bar mitzvah, had the party, and basically, and basically, it was all over at that point. Essentially, if we celebrated, we didn't know what the hell we were celebrating. You didn't know the meaning of it. Yeah, they told you, yeah, we fought the, the Syrians and the, the Syrian Greeks. We beat them up, and Judah Maccabee was a hero, and go light the, the candles and, and go eat the uh, latkes, ate fried food, right? And then for Purim, go, go eat the Chumantash, okay. But there was no real teaching as far, as far as theology was concerned. When I went to college, in that time, when I went to school in 1955, they allowed, there was a quota of allowing only 5% Jews enrollment. So there's one fraternity and the Jewish guys joined the Jewish fraternity. I started, I took a course in comparative religion. I don't remember too much about it, but I do remember coming home and asking my father, Pop, do you believe in God? He says, what are you asking me that for? He says, go next door and go talk to Abe Wasserman. He went to university. He's an educated man. He's a lawyer. You don't ask questions like that. I, mean, I wouldn't know something like that. That was the mentality of the vast majority of the world that I came from, and particularly the my father's world, which was a combination of the Roaring Twenties, good guys, terrific guys, and the children of the immigrant Jews that came from Eastern Europe. The Jewish gangster, yes, there was an absolute need to show the world we are no longer going to be victims, to put our heads down and we're gonna take beatings and we're gonna become suppressed and we're gonna be dominated and we're gonna be, no, this, this changed. In 1970, I went to Africa and I worked for Meyer Lansky's slot machine, Bally slot machine operation. They had made joint venture partnership with two gangsters from Beirut, Lebanon, two Arabs. It was quite an experience. 
I stayed there for over a year. The, the Arabs bought back the business. I came home. They wanted the, they pleaded with me to stay with them. And this was Lagos, Nigeria. But uh, I came home. And a few years later, I decided to go into the slot machine business in New York City, which was completely illegal. We put out the first machines in back rooms of bodegas in New York, 19, July of 1977. It took two months. Everybody in New York, every gangster in New York knew me or heard of me and needed to, um, wanted to get into the business. They heard about the Jew from Jersey. I was a popular figure. But not only did the mobsters hear about me, but the FBI heard about me. And because I was entrepreneurial and I had all this history and experience and uh, in the gambling machine business, I became the central figure of the illegal gambling machine business in New York. It became a monstrous business. Shortly afterwards, uh, there was a dispute between different mobs as to my mob affiliation. However, that got resolved and clarified because I came, came one day to my office. Three gentlemen sat down and explained the rules of the underworld are your father was with us and therefore your identification is with our specific mob. You um, identify as a Jew and the people respect you because you were Jewish? I made it very clear I was a Jew. And I made it very clear you're going to get a fair deal with me. And I always, always made it my business to make sure that everybody was comfortable with a deal. And I said, the reason I do that is because I want to project the right image of what a Jew is all about. In a most complicated world, the underworld. And as a result of that, for that reason that I took that attitude, that's the reason I'm sitting here, I'm alive. So when uh, our son was four years of age, I married to a Jewish girl from Buenos Aires, daughter of Polish immigrants who raised their daughter, not in any way religious, but strictly cultural. Everything was Yiddish. The Yiddish language spoken at home, Jewish food, Jewish theater, Yiddish theater, Yiddish music, Yiddish literature, Yiddish shula. She went to school to learn Yiddish so she could write the letters to the mishpucha in all over the world who um, emigrated to France, to Belgium, to Israel, to Canada, to Brazil, to the United States. So everything was Yiddish. However, if she stepped inside of a shul, maybe once or twice in her life. Well, my son was four years of age. I was with my wife, Clara, on a vacation in Israel, and we were at the old Sheraton Hotel. And I told her, I came up with a great idea for his education. She said, what's that? I said, we're gonna send him to the Hebrew Youth Academy. and. Uh, she said, over my dead body. I have powers of persuasion. And after an hour and a half, she agreed to, uh, she, saw, she started to see things the way I saw them. Anyways, that young lad, that, ba that four-year-old today, is a Talmudic scholar, great rabbi, gives Daf Yomi eight mezuzah kissing kids. Now, we reconciled, I reconciled my world I kept my balance by myself. As I sent him to Hebrew Youth Academy, I said to myself, I don't know anything about the Jewish religion. I know things about Zionism, I know a lot of history, but I really don't know anything about God. God, Rambam, Rashi. So I don't like being stupid. I don't like being dumb. And so I made it a, a lifetime effort to become knowledgeable about the Jewish religion, including going to shul. And then, of course, 
Somebody mentioned there's a rabbi in Brooklyn. Unbelievable. Let's go see him. And it was a Saturday night. I think three couples, we went for dinner. Then afterwards, we took a ride to Brooklyn to 770 Eastern Parkway down the block. And I seen the rabbi, I seen the Rebbe. I was fascinated. I saw something that uh, was I never saw before. Place was packed on a Saturday night. And of course, then I started to become curious. And I would go more and more. And we joined the Orthodox Shul in Livingston, New Jersey. So your question is, what is the, the greatest thing that you, that you learned from being in the mob? I say, right without might is useless. Why do I say that? Right is not sufficient. You're only halfway there. You need to have might. It's got to be the strength, the power, the force to reinforce the fact that you're right. As we're learning today with the struggle that's going on right now in Gaza. I'm 85 years of age. I'm going to be 86 in January. About a year ago, somebody who was like a godson to me, a son of Italian Jewish immigrants from Tripoli, Libya. His name is Abi. We call him Sicilian Abi. They call him, they branded him Sicilian Abi, street kid. Very smart, very successful. He, uh, he says, Pop, we need to form a defense organization. We got to make Jewish kids tough. They're not tough. And he says, there's rising anti-Semitism. I says, I know about it, A.B. He said, we want you to be the godfather. We want you to godfather it. I said, fine. So um, I accepted the responsibility. And the um, name of our organization is called United Empowered We Stand. The legacy that I want to leave behind before I go. I don't want to go out of this world. At this particular time, I came into this world in 1938 when the Nazis were on the rise. And it looks like I'm going to go out of this world when Muslim terrorism is on the rise. They say from river to the sea, Palestine will be free. We're going to say from river to the sea, Jews reclaim God's property. I leave you with that. <laughs>